Welcome ladies and gents, Chris Andre here, you can find me at BetBoxing on Twitter, or of course you can subscribe to the channel, let's talk boxing, let's start off talking about Tyson Fury and Dillian White, the fight has sold 85,000 tickets within the first three hours of going on general sale, Frank Warren has actually applied to local authorities to increase the capacity at Wembley Stadium to 100,000, which would be a new British boxing attendance record, this is massive news and a lot of people are saying, ah, oh, you see Eddie Hearn used to say that Tyson Fury can't sell like Anthony Jones, Joshua, you've had a lot of American pundits too say that without Deontay Wilder, Tyson Fury alone is not a cash cow. This seems to rubbish that. However, there is a caveat to all this. StubHub, the company which enables you to, well, both the individual and I believe the company themselves, buy tickets and then resell them on at a a higher price essentially they're essentially legalized ticket touts okay this is an essential essentially a legalized black market for tickets um have bought a massive massive amount of tickets you get different reports on what this is some people are saying it's half the stadium other people are saying it's something like twenty thousand. others are saying it's thirty thousand. now that's not to say that those tickets won't go on sale but you know, tickets that were worth, say, £100 are being sold now for £500. It really is uh, something that, in my opinion, squeezes the life out of fans. You know, fans that might want to go. Imagine you're a father who's got two kids and you really want to go to this fight. You are just priced out of it. You might not be able to go and attend the fight that your kids really want to see. You know, their heroes want to see. And instead, you've got these corporate seats of guys that maybe not even interested in boxing. And this is the same old thing. It's nothing new. But Frank Warren has been very critical of Eddie Hearn in the past about this. And now he's allowed it with StubHub. So let me know what your opinion is on this. Let me know what you think as well about how the ticket sales will go. You know, Dillian White is not doing his part to sell the fight. He's not been given a cut of the pay-per-view. And he's basically thinking, listen, I was unhappy with a split. You're not giving me a cut of the pay-per-view. I have no obligation to help promote the fight for you to benefit. So why should I do what it is you want me to do? Why should I jump through hoops and expend unnecessary energy traveling here and there, disrupting my camp in order to try and promote the fight? No, 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 no. You do that on your own while I remain focused on trying to rip the title away from Tyson Fury. Let me know what your opinion is on this. Try to let fan allegiances go and try and let me think about whether you think that this fight will sell as well as they hope it will sell. Now, moving on from that, John Fury has been having a real go at Carl Frampton. Why? Because Carl Frampton dared to pick Jake Paul to beat Tommy Fury. This is not a good look for John Fury, to be honest with you. It comes across as very emotional, almost uncontrolled. It comes across as insecure as well. You know, if somebody's going to pick against your son and you're 100% sure your son's going to win, you're just going to laugh it off and say, okay, we'll see. You're going to look very stupid afterwards. This thing of having a real go at him and say, you don't know anything about boxing. I don't want to talk to you. It's a very insecure act. Why is he doing this? Yes, I know he got angry with David Hay as well when, when Hay was picking Wilder to beat Fury. But he didn't react quite like this. He wasn't dismissive in this way. He wanted to bet David Hay. He was certain. He was, you know, you know that John Fury is a fiery character. He's going to act in that way. But he didn't send him away and said, I don't want to talk to you. I refuse to engage with you. This is different. What is it? Is John Fury nervous about Tommy Fury? Because listen, let me tell you something. You may, I mean, for all we know, Cole Frampton might be begging that Tom, Tommy Fury wins this fight. He might be nervous. Every sinew of his body might be rooting for Tommy Fury. Just like a football fan, you might be an Arsenal fan and you're playing away in Europe. You're playing at Juventus or Bayern Munich or wherever else and you're thinking, we're going to lose tonight. And your prediction is, oh, I don't think we're going to get a result. It doesn't mean you don't want to get that result, right? So a prediction shouldn't be taken so personally. For some reason, this happens quite a bit in boxing, but I just found it to be a bit over the top from John Fury. Let me know what you think and why you think he reacted in this way. Moving on from that, Canelo Alvarez will be fighting Dimitri Bivol next, as you're all aware, and then Gennady Golovkin, as long as Golovkin beats Murata. And long-time subscribers will know that I've been a critic of Canelo's in many regards on many different things. But we don't do fanboying on this channel, we don't pick sides. If a fighter deserves to be criticized, he'll be criticized. If he deserves to be praised, he'll be praised. And something's been going on on Twitter, which I do not understand. This is mainly from an American market. I've seen it a lot from uh, both Benavidez fans and also Charlo fans. So it's happening from two different sets of fan bases. They're both questioning his choices and... They were angry that Canelo Alvarez came out and said that these guys need to start fighting each other in order to get a shot at him. But is this actually unreasonable? Let's consider this for a minute. Let's say Canelo Alvarez is going to fight twice a year, once every six months, which is something that a lot of the top 
bracket of the fighters do in this day and age, right? He would fight Bivol and Triple G. That's going to take up pretty much a year. And then you've got Benavidez, say, and Andrade. That would be another year. That takes you to two years. And so then what's Charlo going to do? Sit around waiting for two and a half years? So what Canelo is saying here is not unreasonable. In this particular regard, you have to give him massive props. He's taking on a real challenge in Bivol. All right, Triple G is not the man he used to be, I don't believe, 40 years old. You know, it's a shame we never got to see the third fight earlier. Nonetheless, still Triple G. And then you're talking about him being willing to fight another top dog the top dog that comes through all these other guys fighting each other this is not unreasonable what we need to stop hearing is guys like benavidez his manager saying he wants seven million in order to fight andrade it's ridiculous so in this particular case canelo alvarez is 100 percent right nothing he has said is unreasonable let me know if you disagree don't you want to see your fighters fighting the best it will boost their legacy. And if you believe in the guy, you believe he's going to win those tight fights, right? So what is the issue here? Moving on from Canelo Alvarez, let's talk a little bit about Shane McGuigan going in hard on Ben Davison. But although that's not so subtle, of course, we know there's this MTK and McGuigan Jim beef that's been firing on for a while now. Has Shane McGuigan also unconsciously or subconsciously revealed what he believes to be the end of the road or of Josh Taylor, does he feel that Josh is nearing the end of his elite level career? Let's consider this, okay? It's a bit of a psychological deep dive, as you know we like to do here on this channel. I've broken up an interview he's done with Boxing Social into four separate parts. I think he makes four separate points that need to be considered. First and foremost, he says, I don't think he's the same Josh Taylor that was in my gym. I'm disappointed. I've done a lot of work with him over the years. I've done five years of fantastic work with him. Honestly, it frustrates me to see him boxing like that. And I know it's not the weight. It's simply because he's trying to change his style. What is he saying there? He's saying straight away, all the great work that I've done has been unraveled. This guy that everybody rates as a great trainer, he rates himself as a great trainer. And listen, make no mistake, me, Chris Andre, I think they're both quality trainers, right? So I'm not taking sides here. I'm simply trying to relay what Shane McGuigan's saying. Shane McGuigan saying he's undone. Ben Davison has undone the great work that I've done with Josh Taylor. And it's frustrating to me because it's not the weight. It's not some physical detriment. It's the fact that they're trying to change his style and they're moving him away from what he's good at. And this brings us on to the second part of the interview. He's, Taylor said in an interview with Sky Sports that he looked back at the pro Grey fight and said he thought he could have done certain things better. And actually, right now, he should be looking back at that fight and thinking those are the things that you could have done better. And actually, it makes you more vulnerable because you're getting out jabbed. Now, just to clarify that, because it's a little bit unclear, but what he's basically trying to say is that the things that Taylor felt he should have changed is actually what he needs to revert back to. Yes, okay, you might have to improve one or two things, but you're moving away from who you are, basically. Those things where you think, all right, I need to be a better boxer at range and I need to work on that. No, you need to forget that and go back to what you're doing is what he's say basically saying. He goes on to say, he's a high-paced pressure fighter that's fantastic on the inside, but his hands were down by his chest and he was walking into punches and getting his head jabbed off. He needs to be better than that, right? So he's basically saying, that Ben Davison, Lee Wiley, this fantastic team that Josh Taylor's got behind him, who are very scientific and analytical, are actually misanalyzing what Josh Taylor needs to do. Now, so far, whether you agree with this or not, whether this is true or not, is a whole other story. Whether they're to blame, I can't possibly say for this particular fight. What I can say is that from my personal perspective, I did feel that, yes, Josh Taylor, like I said in my review, was struggling to get inside. And like I've said in the past, get inside cleanly. What I've said in the past is that while he's a very good boxer at range, he's not elite at range. Where he's elite, where his bread and butter is, is on the inside. Now, I agree here with Shane McGuigan. So on that particular part of the analysis, I agree wholeheartedly. Now, some people will say, yeah, but you need to add other facets to your game. Take Anthony Joshua, for instance. A lot of people feel he needs to leave McCracken. He's brought in Angel Fernandez. He needs to go away, learn to be more fluid. Hatman feels that. G-Man feels that. I've heard a lot of people say this. There are other people that feel that actually, no, he needs to revert back to what he was doing initially. So it depends what you feel works. Do you stick to what you do that's best and try and perfect that? Or do you try and add other facets to your game? This is a debate that Josh Taylor needs to decide on himself, of course. And that's not to say that maybe Shane McGuigan couldn't have helped make him a lot more fluid. That seems to be something he's very good at. You've seen it 
generally with Lawrence Okolli against Glavatsky. I know you got some criticism for his last fight, but you know that Shane McGuigan can do things like that. He's trying to make Dubois look more fluid and so on and so forth. I'm not talking about where he should necessarily go. That's for Taylor to decide. Perhaps you guys can let me know where you think he should, his future should reside. The point is, though, he feels as though by trying to be a boxer more than an inside fighter is what's causing him to struggle. And I'll agree with that to an extent. But even on the inside, as I said in my review, his shot selection was wrong. And it took him too long to adjust. Now, one could argue that Ben Davison didn't point that out to him. Or maybe he did and Josh Taylor just didn't listen. I don't know. The adjustment came too late. Go back and watch my review if you want to understand exactly what it is that I'm talking about here. But even if he'd been on the inside and stayed on the inside, would it have been enough? Because earlier in the fight, when he was getting inside, he wasn't having success. So let me know what you think about that. But he then goes on. This is where the key revelations are, in my opinion. He goes on to be asked, do you think Josh Taylor should move to 147? And he says no. He's going to lose his attributes going up to 147. He needs to stay at 140. Now, let's read between the lines. He's telling you this guy should not be focusing on boxing with his hands down by his chest trying to walk in. He needs to get inside. He's a fantastic pressure fighter, but his attributes won't carry to the weight division above. Is Shane McGuigan saying that Josh Taylor is only a brawler, essentially an inside fighting brawler? who cannot have success after 140 at the elite level? If so, and he's already struggling to make the weight, is Shane McGuigan saying that the end of the road is near for Josh Taylor? Because if he's saying that, then can Josh Taylor really have stayed with McGuigan anyway? You can't stay with a trainer that doesn't really believe that you can go up a division if you're at the end of your ability to make the current division. Think about it, right? So is that a subconscious revelation that he thinks that the success of Taylor, that his days of success are numbered? Now, the final point, he goes on to say, I didn't even think Cattrall was that good. He did some great things, but it wasn't like a George Cambosos fight against Lopez where he really shone. He did the basics well and diffused him well. With Josh Taylor, you need to think about what he does. He punches great in combinations. He closes the gap. When he's, uh, he's got great hand defenses and he's a great attacking fighter. Don't take that away from him. So now, not only is he saying that you're misunderstanding what Taylor's doing, he's also saying that this is not a George Cambosos, who's a top-level fighter, and that was his breakout fight. That's essentially what he's saying here. He shone through. This wasn't that sort of thing. This wasn't a revelation. This wasn't a guy you didn't know was a world-class fighter, or however it is that Shane McGuigan considers that performance to have been. This wasn't that. This was a guy who did the basics well. He nullified Josh Taylor on the inside, and that was that. In other words, not only are you getting Josh Taylor wrong and you're taking away his key attributes, you're getting him losing to average, basic, but solid fighters. Let me know what you think about all these things that we've spoken about. Do you agree with Shane regarding the approach of Taylor? Do you agree with Shane that Ben Davison has ruined Josh Taylor? But more importantly, the bit that I find most interesting, does Shane McGuigan's insistence that Josh Taylor must remain at 140. If Taylor is struggling to make 140, does this mean that he no longer even believes that Josh Taylor could have success beyond that so that his days are numbered? And if so, how can Josh Taylor possibly stay with him? Let me know what you think, ladies and gents. Thanks for watching. Chat to you soon. Take care. God bless.